Okay, I see that it, it was my mic on. Can you hear me? I see that it is 7 o'clock, so that in the interest of our East Lansing community, I will call us to order at 7.01 p.m. Uh, Ms. Hocor, could you um, help us with the roll call, please? Dr. Chambers. Present. Dr. Lyons. Here. Ms. Ferris Highland. Here. Dr. Etzel. Here. Ms. Comier. Here. Ms. Fink. Here. Mr. Martin. Here. And our student representatives are not with us tonight, but Gretchen <coughs> Rojewski will be stopping in. <coughs> um, and Ms. Laco. Here. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Lyons, would you help us um, remember our mission statement, please? Yep, um, our mission statement is nurturing each child, educating all students, and building world citizens. Excellent. Next on the agenda is the oath of office. I'll need the assistance of Ms. Hocor again with this. And uh, Mr. Martin, I'll ask you to step to the podium, please. That's our podium. I'll make it raise your right hand, please. I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of this state. I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of this state. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Member of the Board of Education of the School District of the City of East Lansing and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Member of, board, of the Board of Education of the School District of the City of East Lansing. Ingham and Clinton Counties, Michigan, according to the best of my ability. Ingham and Clinton Counties, Michigan, according to the best of my ability. Okay. And with that, I believe it is officially again Trustee Martin. Welcome back, sir. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Next on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Uh, Trustee Martin, can I ask you to trouble us to help us with that, please? I move the Board of Education approve the agenda of the March 13, 2023 meeting as presented. Second. It was moved by Trustee Martin, seconded by Trustee Lyons. Is there any discussion? Yeah, I would like to amend the agenda to add an action item B. Uh, safe gun storage resolution. Uh, Trustee Martin, would you consider that a friendly amendment to your motion? I would consider it a friendly amendment. I have no, uh, I'm, I'm content with the, um, the amendment. All right. Trustee Lyons, would you, are you okay with your yep, second? second? Okay. Third, whatever we need to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, any additional discussion? Um, I guess then all in favor of the agenda as amended, um, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Next we move to the approval of the minutes. I move the Board of Education approves the February 27, 2023 regular meeting minutes as presented. Second. It was moved by Trustee Edsel, seconded by Trustee Ferris Highland. Is there any discussion on this item? All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, next on the agenda is recognition. Uh, Trustee Ferris Highland, I'll hand that over to you. Okay, I have um, three items. One, Science Night held on February 28th at Marble was attended by over 200 families and was a huge success. The event boasted over 36 presenters, including Potter Park Zoo, Fenner, Impression 5, the East Lansing Public Library, and WKAR's Curious Crew. Our East Lansing High School robotics program and students for females in STEM were also on site throughout the night, as were many MSU student-led groups. 
Many thanks to everybody who made this important event possible. The second item is the Michigan High School Athletic Association has selected 14 student athletes from Class A member schools to receive scholarships, and senior Naomi Siwa Sowa is one of them. Naomi played three seasons of varsity volleyball and will, will play her fourth of varsity softball this spring. She earned all area and all league in both sports, all region and volleyball, and also all league academic honors in both. She served as captain of both varsity teams. She carries a 4.0 GPA and earned AP Scholar Award, posting highest possible score on two exams. She is currently participating in second year of National Honor Society and as chapter historian. She is playing fourth year in school's wind ensemble as first chair clarinet as a senior and previously earned festival award and performed at Michigan Music Conference. Congrats to Naomi. And our third item is recently 41 of our high school students spent four days in Kalamazoo at the Mid-American Model U United Nations and co-advisor Mark Pontoni was told that the East Lansing High School students had the second highest margin of victory achieved by any school ever and more than twice the points of the second place school. Of the six main committees at the conference, our students won top honors in five of them, and in the sixth committee, they took second honors. They also won a couple of second honors in committees that East Lansing High, East Lansing High School students also won top honors in as well, a very rare achievement. Isla Blundell and Jack McGuire won top honors in crisis committees during which delegates are presented with a fictitious international event that they must try to negotiate over a six hour period. Isla's win came in the Secretary General's crisis where 14 students are selected from the hundreds in attendance for their merit up to that point. East Lansing was awarded six of those 14 spots, unprecedented in conference history. Mona Borahan, Uya I, I do see ye, and Jack McGuire had the second honors, while Skylar Hamlin, Edith Pendel, Isla Blundell, Evie Whitrock, Alden Delgado and Kate McAndrews won top honors in their committees. The Iran delegation of Henry Mahler, Joe Powers, Mackenzie Smith, Uya Iduciyi, excuse me, and Fletcher Wozniak won top honors in the delegation competition. East Lansing won the top team award and Edith Pendle won the top individual award among the hundreds of students in attendance. She won the Jonathan Perry Ambassador Award and was recognized as the best delegate at the conference. One last shout out is, goes to Emily Zahn, co-advisor for stepping into this role as a new teacher this year. Thanks, Sam. That's it. Wonderful, thank you so much. Are there other items for recognition this evening? Awesome, thank you so much. And congratulations to all of our amazing students. Um, next on the agenda is the student representative report. Um, our designated student representatives were unable to be here this evening, but we do have Gretchen Rajewski who is willing to, wow, step onto the stage, literally. I've still got my good knees, so you know, I might as well use them. Thank you so much, Gretchen, oh, and- Of course, um, I'm gonna try and put my phone so I can see it. Okay, there we go. So as I've been previously so kindly introduced by so many people, my name is Gretchen Rajewski, I'm a student body uh, vice president, and um, I'm here in place of the actual school board li liaisons of Gabe Benavides and Xander Milok, who could unfortunately not be here. Um, I'll start off today with obviously the news that's recently been announced of Shannon Mayfield's resignation from the position of East Lansing High School principal. It is profoundly saddening, especially given through these, un especially through these unprecedented events to kind of lose another member of our East Lansing community. Um, going forward into the new hiring process, which for the information available seems to be going through for spring, um, as a student representative, I would ask to continue with a commitment to equity and equal opportunities given to those qualified for the position. Um, moving on to more recognition, Model UN is just going to keep on rolling because that's also on my list. But starting off with East Lansing Boys Basketball, they won districts last week against Lansing Waverly with a score of 65 to 50. 67 to 50, my bad. Um, they're also playing right now. Don't know where the score stands on that. I think they went into overtime. I don't know basketball. We, oh, we just won. So, woo, woo that. News in the happening, people. Wow. Um, <laughs> East Lansing Theater's production of Chicago Teen Edition recently opened, so a thank you to Mr. Smith, Mr. DeHaan, Mr. DeConing, Mr. Lars Lear, and Mr. Gadena, as well as all the staff and crew for all the work they put in. As a heads up, you can still see the production. It is running from this Wednesday through Sunday in the East Lansing High School Auditorium. Um, now on to the Model UN, real stars of the night. Um, they had quite the award suite at Maimon in Kalamazoo recently, bringing home a record number of awards, as stated by Trustee Ferris Highland. 
So a huge congrats as well as a thanks to the staff advisor, Mr. Pontoni, as well as the students and other staff members that represented East Lansing so well. Um, upcoming East Lansing and East Lansing student and East Lansing community events include Science Olympiad competing in the regional competition this Saturday at Lansing Community College, and National Honor Society is hosting their biannual blood drive this Wednesday, having gold 30 pints donated by East Lansing High School students, and 32 people have signed up so far. So continuing on that positivity train, um, that's all I have to report today. So thank you for your time, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you, Mr. Juski. We appreciate your report. <clears throat> Next on the agenda is the superintendent's report. Um, superintendent Lako, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. I want to start with some comments regarding last Wednesday's school closing. Uh, in collaboration with the East Lansing Police Department, we were able to identify the source of the threatening social media post that was made late Tuesday night, and an individual subsequently confessed to making that post. Based on information gained from the investigation, at no time was the East Lansing community or ELPS at risk of danger. We also recognize, however, that the threatening post and school closing caused stress, anxiety, fear, frustration, and inconvenience for many, many students and families. Our process for responding to and investigating the social media threat worked as it should, and the student and family are cooperating with school administrators and law enforcement. Uh, a little bit on our leadership update. Our uh, East Lansing High School principal, Mr. Shannon Mayfield, submitted a letter of resignation effective March 10th, 2023. Mr. Mayfield had been on leave for personal reasons since January 25th and had been employed by the district as the high school principal since fall of 2022. For the near future, Mrs. Ashley Schwartzbeck will be the interim principal and Mr. Jeff Lampy will be the interim associate principal and long-term leadership decisions we made and communicated this spring. I want to continue advertising ongoing support for our students and community following the shooting at Michigan State University. East Lansing Public Library is continuing to offer um, support through counselors uh, and facility or for their therapy dogs. And through the end of the month on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 1230 to 5 o'clock at the East Lansing Public Library. Just a reminder that tomorrow is a half day of school for elementary, um, elementary only, and that spring break begins a week from Friday, which is March 24th, and then students and staff will return to school Monday, April 3rd. We are also uh, currently registering incoming kindergartners and young five students. We're asking folks to register by March 17th, and that information and registration link is on our website, on our homepage. And a little bit about our school safety and student support updates, and uh, some kind of different perspective that uh, oh, I've came to recognize through some conversations um, from our previous meetings. Uh, that I want to share a little bit about and then provide a few updates. Our initial safety enhancement plan that had been shared at the prior few Board of Education meetings had been organized into immediate short-term and long-term action steps, recommendations and considerations. And following some feedback, discussion and reflection, another way we could look at uh, our responsive action steps would be into the categories of infrastructure, personnel, training, student supports and community engagement. So I just want to share some uh, actions that have taken place in these areas over the last two weeks since the last board meeting. Uh, under infrastructure, we've had the new lockdown panic buttons installed at the high school main office for more immediate access by our administrative assistants. Our, two of our individuals from DK Security started at the high school today. They'll help provide additional hall, bathroom, door, and camera monitoring and supervision. Uh, with the community engagement, members of the Board of Education and I attended uh, the March 1st meeting, I should say a couple members, two or three, uh, of the East Lansing Parent Advocacy Team at the East Lansing Public Library. Our goal was to listen to the stories and experiences of the individuals, open up lines of communication uh, between that group and the district, and collaborate together to determine actionable steps that will make a difference for our students. 
Following that meeting, we invited some representatives from the LPAT uh, to the high school to meet with some district and high school administrators. We reviewed discipline data and brought some new faces to the table who hadn't previously been engaged in those discussions yet. And our group from there decided to meet on a bi-weekly basis to continue discussion and collaboration. And finally, last evening, a couple, a few, three other members of the Board of Education and I attended the March 12th LPAP meeting via Zoom. The group shared progress made so far and provided some input on asks of the district. And I know they'll be speaking here tonight during public comment as well. Uh, under training, our district wellness leader, Lindsay Young, met with Cindy Horgan to learn more about Move Mindfully, a program that integrates mindfulness and movement into our schools and classrooms. That's a program we heard about through public comment at recent meetings. And under student supports, one new student mentoring program has been added at the middle school, the United Mentoring Program, which has a target audience of at-risk youths aged 12 through 19, and they'll be offering a morning mentoring program. Also, the Turning Point of Lansing program has expanded its access to both 6th and 7th grade students at the middle school as well. And that's all I have tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for the superintendent about the superintendent's report? I have a question. Um, I was one of the board members who attended last night's meeting, although I wasn't a board member yet, I guess. But um, there was some discussion about how to involve the various committees of the school board at that meeting. And I noticed in, some, in the packet of information we have, there's a packet that includes some committee descriptions and some bylaws that relate to our committee structure. Are those intended for the superintendent's report or are they intended for a different agenda item? So, um, I'll jump in here. I'm sorry, so, I didn't mean to. Tally was there. Tally asked me, uh, I'm sorry, Trustee Ferris Simon, Tally Ferris, however you spell Whoever it. Whoever I am. Um, and so the two of us asked Kelly, where are the, our descriptions? And that's where that came from. I was going to bring it up under board discussion because I do feel we need to have a more uh, visible description of our committees. So can we leave it for board discussion? That, uh, that answers my question. I just wanted to make sure that, that I understood. So thank you. Sure. Sorry. Are there other questions for the superintendent? Okay. Next on the agenda is consent agenda, but I, and I should have clarified this earlier. There are no actual items under the consent agenda. Okay. Then we will move on to presentation, which I'm excited about. We have students from <laughs> the Model UN who clearly rocked it. Clearly. Clearly in the Kalamazoo. <laughs> so let's clap them up. <laughs> they are accompanied by Mr. Pontoni. They go through a very dark hallway and then just emerge in the light <laughs> up here. So if you all want to come, yeah, in front of the stage over here to this little podium here, and then we have a portable mic. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, but this is very important for your family who is watching from home and for historical preservation. The meetings are recorded, and so forevermore you will be able to see this meeting and your families will appreciate being able to see the recordings. It's the mom and me. I can't help but <laughs> so want this to be preserved for you. And this is the best camera angle. Up there. So you have, you really, why don't you come up in here so you can look at the board? Come on up here. You can do it. And you can All stand right. in front of us. We can stand up. Okay. There we go. All right. Uh, thank you for giving us a moment to, uh, to come and talk to you. I didn't get emotional at all until I heard all those things because it hadn't sunk into me yet. I mean, it's been a crazy time. Anyway, I, I um, wanted to come and uh, introduce some of the students to you and to let them share some experiences. Um, I wanted to say, uh, this is how I see East Lansing. This is the quality of kids that, that we ought to be celebrating. and. Um, not all the kids are AP kids in our program. You know, it's a very diverse group of students. This is just a handful of the 41 kids we took. And as 
uh, people were congratulating me for some reason. I, it's really all them. I mean that sincerely. I kept saying we took 41 students for four days, worked till midnight or later, and I had not one issue, not one behavior issue, not one piece of drama, super supportive of each other. Uh, our senior class, completely amazing in training our younger delegates. This is my East Lansing. This is what I want. When I leave here, this is what I want to remember. So uh, maybe that's selfish, but that's how I feel. Uh, we did have some award winners, but I first wanted to ask Leo Kendall to come up. Uh, when I told him we were coming to the meeting, um, she said to me something like, I didn't win an award. Can I talk? I go, yeah, you can talk, because that's what I want them to hear. It's not about the hardware. It's, for me, it has never been about that. So now I set you up to say something profound. Can you handle that? <laughs> uh, I can try. I um, prepared a statement because I'm a bit of a rambler. Yeah. So. And then could you introduce yourself? And I'll have all of you mm -hmm. introduce yourselves. Yeah. Um, so my name's Leo. I'm a sophomore. Um, I've been a model UN since the beginning of my freshman year. Um, and I'll be the first to admit that I'm not a big award winner. But there's a reason that I've come back to this club. Within the span of a year and a half, I've attended six different conferences and represented six different countries. Sorry, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> okay. um, ranging from Latvia to Pakistan to China. And even though not a single one of those delegations have won me the highest honors, I really do love this club. For me, Model UN has always been bigger than a trophy or bragging rights. The <laughs> there is a world we must all inherit that I and my peers will be responsible for in less than a decade. In my opinion, there is no better preparation for that than Model UN. By being challenged to see the world through every lens possible, make equitable compromises, and co-write resolutions with people we've literally never met, I've seen my fellow delegates and I become diplomatic, empathetic, and caring human beings. It's one of the reasons why our club's community is so strong. We all, dare, we all care so deeply for each other because Model UN has taught us that no matter the popularity or power, every perspective and opinion counts. It has taught us that the best diplomats aren't the ones who fight to make their voice the loudest, but those that fight to make others just as loud. Thanks to the work of executive boards of the past and present, Mr. Pontoni, Ms. Barrage from last year, Ms. Zan, and so many more, this club has become a safe space, and that's why I return. Sure, we have the capability to and do win awards, but above all, Pontoni and our co-presidents, Edith and Alden, alongside all the executive board, er, yeah, um, have fostered a community of truly kind and sympathetic delegates, students, and world citizens. You want to talk? Um, good evening. My name is Maggie Callender. Um, I'm currently a junior at East Lansing High School. Um, this is actually my second year of being in Model UN. Um, some of you may remember I stood in front of you guys last year advocating for our club. Um, and I'm here again today just to stress the importance uh, that Model UN has been on my life and the values I have learned from being in this club. Um, I feel that Model UN pushes students to take a look at um, issues that we may feel personally do not affect us our day-to-day -day lives. Um, through our various conferences and meetings, we have addressed very um, serious topics that affect people around the globe, even if it's not in our country. It affects millions um, of people in various other countries. And so Model UN kind of forced us, or at least myself, to look at these situations even though I may feel I do not have an influence. Um, it taught me that I can still do what I can in my power to help make the world a better place. And I felt like Model UN has really helped me have that value in life. And I think it's really important, especially as we're all gonna be adults soon um, and going out into the real world where we have jobs, we're gonna be independent, and we're gonna have more power to influence our community. And so this value that we can actually make a difference and like can think of ideas on how to do that um, it's just really important to me. So that's why I really love, love this club. Yeah. Hello, uh, I am Joe Powers. I'm a junior. Uh, Model UN is something that I uh, found myself kind of uh, stumbling into uh, middle of last year. Uh, I, I don't know uh, why I <laughs> ended up choosing it, but I did. And uh, just uh, by sheer chance, I ended up finding one of the best groups of people I've ever spent a 
extended amount of time in a southwest Michigan city. <laughs> in, uh, with, uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely something that I found myself coming to enjoy quite a bit, even through some very uh, low points. Uh, I think I am very happy to say for myself that I finally, uh, uh, quote, won something, but I think that there's definitely uh, better ways to view it, and I think that this is, uh, this is one of my favorite things to do, and I am glad that we've been given this time. Wonderful. Um, hi guys, uh, I am Edith. Uh, I'm Alden. Uh, we're the co-presidents of the club this year, um, and I'll just say a couple things and then I'll pass the mic over to Alden, but um, I think I speak for both of us when I say that we're both very proud to have been part of what Model UN has done this year. Um, both of us have been in Model UN for a while, and we've watched the club grow, and we've watched leaders emerge within the club. Um, I think that leadership and collaboration are not always easy, and being in an environment like a committee in Model UN um, is sometimes a very stressful environment. And there's a lot of people in those committees who come from lots of different perspectives. Um, and learning to work with people, sometimes people who know almost everything about a topic, or at least they think they do, or people who know not very much about a topic, but being able to incorporate all of their opinions together is almost an extremely vital skill for young people to learn. It's something that I'm very proud to have learned, or you know, I'm on my trajectory to learn that type of skill. And um, I'm really proud to see a lot of delegates from our team um, foster relations with delegates younger than them and be really good stewards um, and really good community members. And so, yeah, I'm really proud of our team and I'm really excited to see where it goes in the future. Hey again, uh, I'm Alden, I'm the other co-president. Uh, so I stumbled across uh, Model UN my junior year. I had not been like a long time uh, like person who, who did debate or public speaking. I really had absolutely no clue how to do it. Mm -hmm. But because of the, the amazing board we've had in Mr. Pontoni these past two years, um, I found myself welcomed into a club where I could share my opinion, and my opinion really mattered. I, I found such confidence in my ability to speak throughout the past two years. And something that we've really been pushing, especially this past year, is expanding the club, especially since we don't really want to attract like a niche of student who, who only excels. We want to bring in as many students as we can to excel together. And so we were questioning for a long time whether such a large expansion of the club this year was really worth all of our effort and all of the attention it created. But I have to say, as, as a co-president, and with the time I've spent with these kids, I'm watching just some of the underclassmen, they, they come out of committee and they, they have this light in their eyes. And they're like, you won't, you won't believe who I worked with on this resolution. Or I know that this person would never do that, but I did it with them anyways. And so it's just, it's so exciting to see them just apply themselves really in, in anything. And many of these students struggle you know, in school just being provided a challenge or something that's interested, interesting to them, and being, having this ability to, to talk with other kids that go to your school and you know, meet up with, on something of similar interest, it's just so great to really see them you know, come into them, their selves and, and shine sort of as an individual and as a speaker. So I'm just so proud of all of our kids and how far this club has come in really a short span of a couple of years. And I think we really can attribute a lot of that to Mr. Pontoni. It really, it really is these guys. It, uh, it honestly is. They, I don't know if you even know this. They, uh, Edith and Alden, organized a Model UN at East Lansing this year where we brought schools in. They actually ran a conference all on their own. I told them not to do it. They did it anyway. Uh, <laughs> brought schools from Traverse City and Bald Lake and um, came and spent a Saturday in the fall debating. They, they put it all together. Uh, okay, we've been up here a long time. Was there anyone else that, are we good? Okay. Maybe if, yeah, if, if What's that? people, do, not everybody has to say no, anything. No, I understand. We'd love to, I, we've taken a lot they, of No, 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 no. They, and they, anyone can say anything they want to say. We, uh, trust or me. Or just introduce We them. are happy to, but we'll at, if they would um, at least just introduce themselves. But okay. they can say do, more. Were you going to say something, Jack? Sure. Okay, please. One more. I'd like to start this out by saying, Mom, I told you I wasn't going to say anything tonight, but, you know, things happen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
So I guess I don't. I guess oh, okay. First of all, I'm I'm Jack Rumsey. I'm a junior. Uh, so I joined Model UN last year, just because I thought it you know it sounded vaguely kind of interesting. I did not know what I got myself into <laughs> at that point. Um, but over the course of the past what year? Time is weird. A year and a half or <laughs> so at this point, like I've. It's just, I can't put into words how incredible this experience has been. I've met so many phenomenal people and formed so many relationships with people that I frankly don't think I would have gotten to meet otherwise. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I feel like I finally found like a spot where I can really mesh with people and I really fit in completely. I, I guess. Okay. <laughs> All right. And we're yeah. done. Who else hasn't we introduced good? themselves? All right. So the other people who are here. I'm Katie Palsrock, and I'm in tenth grade. Um, I'm Maisie Minnick. I'm a senior, and I'm the secretary of the club. Hi, I'm Mona. I'm a junior. Well, also one of our award winners. All right. As we are getting ready to sashay across. I want to thank the, the board for its support. Person. What's that? There's one more. Was there Wait, someone else? Who did I miss? We got everybody. Oh. Yeah, we're good. Right, um, thank the board for support. Thank my administrators for their support. It's not easy taking 41 kids out of a high school for a couple of days. Uh, the, my colleagues that rescheduled tests on our behalf, all of that. And I also want to thank the East Lansing Education Foundation for their generous support. Um, our budget this year was $25,000 that we had to raise, and the foundation was sensational in helping with, with that, um, and the rest of it, these guys all raised, in addition to becoming awesome. <laughs> so, superstars, we'll take that. Thank you very much, we appreciate it. Are there questions that, for, for any of those students? So I'm really intrigued to hear about um, your recruitment efforts and reaching out to all kinds of different students, and that's really cool to hear. Um, what do you think is the key to your success in doing that? The, you want, you this is me. That? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so as part of my job, I try to help Edith, Edith and Alden as much as I can, and part of that's communication since they already have so much to do with the club. And so I try to reach out to everybody as fast as I can through apps like Remind and GroupMe. And I do everything I can. And if anybody's having difficulty, I always tell them to reach out to me because I'm here for them. And like making sure like we form connections like as the board members of the club is really important. So that way everybody like feels comfortable with us and that they can come to us with any problems, especially regarding Model UN. And I always make sure that like if they can always text me and like through the apps we use, so I always make sure everybody has like all the communication things, that way everybody's on top of everything, and so that's just one of the ways that we communicate through all the apps, so yeah. Awesome. And in terms of recruiting, um, when you have kids like this, students like this, it's infectious, people wanna be part of it. It's like any winning team in any sport. And it, you know, it, re it really is, is that when I started here, we had eight students in the club when Ms. Palmer was here. And uh, that group of students was very happy to have just eight of them. And they said, we don't want any more. And I go, well, then find another teacher because it's not how I operate. And we've grown every single year. I thought we were bursting at the seams this year. And I don't know what will happen. I've had so many kids come up to me. We have four kids going to our conference in Toledo in April that have never done Model UN before. They, they wanted to join. They want to be part of it. So it is, the credit goes to, to to the students in the club and our leadership. They have been welcoming, they have worked tirelessly to get kids ready. We have to write papers, three of them. They have to write three big papers, not huge, but the three papers uh, to go to the conference. And our officers took it upon themselves to organize peer review of every one of those essays. I mean, essentially 120 some essays. They peer reviewed them, got them all submitted in time. That's extraordinary self-motivation and leadership. And, and I think that's why people want to be part of this. I jumped in there, but are there other questions from board members for the students or for Mr. Pontoni? I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say that I'm so proud of you guys. Great job. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. Good dance. Thank you all. Well done. Nice job. Sashay. Yeah. Sashay away, y'all, with some, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for being here. <laughs> okay. okay, next on the agenda is public comment and the blue forms are coming in. When you came in, there were two little music stands with these little blue forms on them. So if you're interested in making public comment, I'll give you a little hint that you should start filling these in um, and we'll start collecting them. Um, this is your opportunity to address the board. Speakers are to confine their remarks to five minutes. If a speaker requires more than five minutes after all other persons who have requested to speak during this part of the meeting have spoken, that speaker will be allowed additional time. The superintendent or other district staff may comment to clear up or avoid significant misunderstandings. And with that, the first person I have is high school schedule, Suzanne Rojas, followed by communication, Brad Lutz. You can come up to, oh, I think we just have one mic tonight. Suzanne, come up and please proceed with your comments. <coughs> um, Ms. Hocord is um, keeping time and you'll hear her time, timer go off. I will respectfully ask you that when you hear that timer, that you end your comments um, where you are. And if not, I will ask you to please stop speaking. <laughs> please go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Suzanne Rojas. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a teacher at the high school. I'm also a parent of two high school students. Um, I'm here today to advocate for both my students and my own personal kids. Um, I'd like to request that the calendar for next school year be changed. As it stands, high school students leave for winter break, come back for two days, and then take exams. If we ended the semester one week earlier, the students could take exams before they leave for break versus immediately upon their return. Um, first of all, it's not in the best interest of students academically to go off for a two-week break and then come back and immediately take exams. I think everyone can agree that doesn't set the students up for success. Um, earlier this year, my students and I noticed what the calendar looked like for next year regarding exams. Uh, I won't repeat some of their comments because they're not all G-rated, but we were all on the same page that um, the students didn't feel like that was a good way for them to be successful on their finals next year. Um, I think it's also important in terms of their mental health. We talk a lot about mental health at East Lansing. Um, if students take their exams before they leave for break, they can actually have a two week break where they rest and refresh before coming back and starting a new semester. Um, if they wait um, and take their exams when they come back, they're gonna spend their whole break being stressed about exams, likely not preparing for them, but being stressed about it the whole time. Um, and again, not a great way to set them up for success. Um, if exams are not moved, you will have some teachers holding their exams before break and some waiting until after. This creates a lot of inequities. Um, for example, a student could have all six of their teachers decide to give their exams before break. So a kid could potentially have six exams in a single day. On the other hand, if exams are moved to before break, there would be actual exam periods where students would only have two exams in a given day. Another problem is that you could also have stu two students in the same class but with different teachers. For example, there's multiple sections of physical science. Um, one teacher could be having their exams before break when the material is fresh in the students' minds. The other teacher could give their exam after break. This is not equitable. Um, over the years, many of my colleagues and I have wanted to have exams before winter break, similar to what happens at the college level. In the past, the only issue that's been brought up against doing this is that it would make the semesters too uneven. For next year, it would only require moving the end of the semester by one week, which wouldn't make the semester lengths that much different. Um, not to mention that we typically lose more time during second semester to things like snow days, state testing, field trips, AP testing, et cetera. So it would actually be better to have second semester be a little bit longer. Um, another issue that was brought up with moving exams to before winter break next year is that some families may leave early for break. To me, that isn't a reason to not do what is best for kids, which is having them take exams before break. If families want to leave early for break, that's up to them and they can make their exams up upon return. Um, we shouldn't disadvantage all of the kids for the sake of the few. And if they're headed away for break, it is likely that they're probably students that are more advantaged to begin with anyway. 
Um, I think we need to make sure that we're doing what's best for all students with an extra focus on our most at-risk students, not making sure that people can take vacations without you know, um, having to make up exams. Um, I know this probably doesn't seem like the biggest issue right now with all the other things going on. However, I wanted to get it on everyone's radar. I'd love to see us being more proactive on every front. Um, being proactive on this front would involve making the decision to move exams to before winter break and doing it soon so that families can make sure to make informed decisions about whether they go on a holiday trip early or not next year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rojas, and thank you for your service to the district. Uh, Nate, next is Brad Lutz, followed by Cherie Brooks. My name's Brad Lutz, and I just wanted to, um, I've been an outspoken critic of our communication in the past, and I just wanted to thank the superintendent for the way she handled this past Wednesday. I know it was a difficult situation, and I thought setting timelines and updating us regularly, regardless if she didn't have information or not, um, was a very good practice, and I would like to see the district continue that policy going forward. I think it was a really outstanding way to keep everybody up to date and something that was a terrible situation, and we knew it was going to take time to figure out, but it, it just kept us informed and able to manage our children's expectations well, too, for the following day of school. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Brooks. And I have two forms for you. So we, do you want to just do them back to back? Sure. Okay. All right. So uh, Ms. Holcourt, she I has. I am Cherie Brooks. I think for my first form is probably uh, for, as a member of the East Lansing Parent Advocacy Team, which is uh, LPAT. So I want to begin with acknowledging the wins because we, we have some and we are appreciative. It, it feels good to come up here and actually say that we, that, that as a team, Parents in this community, we feel we, we are feeling heard. Not necessarily that things are being resolved, but we are feeling heard. So we want to, we asked for collaboration and we were given, we asked for it to be defined and, and, and for an opportunity. We received both representation from every member of the board, including the superintendent at both of our meetings. Um, so we, we were appreciative for that. And those meetings were not, those meetings were heavy. <laughs> because the, I mean, as parents in this community, we had an opportunity to just be really, really uh, transparent. Um, we asked for data to help us identify strategies that are data driven, that build in accountability, and that assist with fostering our ideal experience for our children within this district. Although we didn't receive it in its entirety, we did receive enough to help us begin to move through, um, to move through that process with, this as a, with, the, with the data that was given as a source of truth. We, let me see. We asked for you to help us, help you, help us, and we received invitations to not only review the data collabor collabor collaboratively, with, um, with the administration, so with uh, superintendent and, and members of the high school administration. We also received an invitation to join the intergovernmental committee that's chaired by trustee uh, Monica Fink. So there, there have been opportunities for parents within this community to find ways to connect with the board and, and the district. Our ask tonight is for a full equity audit. We're, at, we're gonna keep asking for it. We're asking for a full equity audit that's inclusive of policies, procedures, guidelines, and trainings that are utilized within this district. We ask that by next meeting that you guys acknowledge that and provide us with some comment or commitment. Um, we, also have to, we also have to acknowledge some shortcomings because while we're move, we, we were formed or born out of the disparaging um, uh, processes for discipline amongst our amongst our students and at the at the game before last there was some behavior with the, some behavior that was presented by the athletic director Nikki Norris that was just absolutely deplorable um, it is it's almost heartbreaking to know that we can have we can have the the model UN students come in with these experiences where they are being taught early, taught early, to to build an appreciation amongst 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 themselves and this community, 
and to have Assistant Director Nikki Norris leave a student out of her acknowledgement of who's on the team. It was purposeful and it was intentional. It was, it was purposeful, it was intentional, and it was just downright ugly. Um, the, what, what the athletic director did is even though the student was a member of the team, they weren't dressed for that, for that game, and when she acknowledged the team, she left that child out. So the child, the child stood behind, with his team, behind the team, but with his team, and is in her face, and she didn't acknowledge him. She's the adult in the room. We're asking for accountability and for, for, for our children to be met at their humanity just to, be, just to be mistreated again and publicly. Publicly, to, to, as a parent, to, to have to shoulder your child's hurt in that public space is, that's, that, that's beyond heavy. So my, our ask, is that there is um, that there's some acknowledgement to that because we we learned and I'm 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 gonna try I'm trying to be mindful of our time we learned that that there is a record of student behavior from the time they enter the district until the time that they graduate we don't have a record of 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 the staff or the administration's behavior that we can review from the time that they enter into the district until they until they they separate from the district. And if we actually give some consideration to that, we're going to see that there's some repeat offenders. So, so there, there's there's an opportunity to there's an opportunity to to facilitate change there, and we we would like to to ask you all to consider that. Um, we also want to acknowledge that in terms of discipline that there, that there is uh, something that's being implemented that we heard of called restorative conversations. While we didn't get a bunch of information about what that actually is or what it looks like, it, it is, we were, we, were, um, we were happy to hear that, that, there, that there is an intervention in place that, uh, ahead of the suspensions. Um, so we, we would like to uh, <laughs> say thank you for that. And that's on behalf of LPAD. That's my Thank you, Ms. Brooks. Yeah, and Thank if you, you. want to, yep. Yeah. All right. My second ask, and this is not LPAT, this is Cherie Brooks as the parent of my child. I have been asking for, um, what I would like is I would like for him to be recognized at graduation. And when I say recognized at graduation, I don't care if it's in the program or if it's a public, or if it's a public recognition. I know that if, for those of you who don't know my child's story, he participate he was he uh, received some disciplinary uh, some disciplinary options that included either being suspended or or taking uh, uh, suspended from the school for for a set of period of time or entering into graduation alliance graduation alliance is an online at your own pace program that is not it, it, it's actually more like modules so if you if you're thinking about graduation alliance and you Think about it like if you have um, work um, uh, policies to review, and they they have all of these things that you these things that you work to. Yes, there's access to a teacher if you email them, but it's not like COVID where you were working with the working with the instructor at the same time. It's at your own pace. My child started in the ninth grade, and and finished the entire program, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, before starting his 10th grade year. And he did that on his own. He didn't do it with, he didn't do it with my help. He did it at the table by himself. And it is important that he receives the same recognition for his academic success. I want you guys to, to be as, as loud and as fierce and as strong as you were with that discipline for his acknowledgement for his academic, academic success. He did it. So my ask is that you guys partner with the school to uh, figure out how to make that happen for him. Um, I've asked the school and their response was a tone deaf. They told me that a, lot of, a handful of students graduate early. So there's really no need to acknowledge him. No one did it the way he did it. So I'm not asking you to acknowledge that he graduate early, is graduating early. I'm asking you to acknowledge that he finished that entire program when there was no expectation for him to do it in that time. That's my ask.
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. Um, I am going to call this uh, last call for public comment. So please, if you're interested in making, I have a couple more forms, but um, if you're interested in making public comment tonight, please make sure you get back there and um, fill your blue form out and um, we'll get it up here. Um, next is Nevea Vasquez um, speaking about high school varsity basketball coach, followed by um, Manuel Vasquez. Um, hello, um, nice to see all you. Um, I'm here to speak on behalf of the players and friends affected by the coaching of Grace Whalen. Um, I can speak for myself that the coaching of Grace Whalen and Hannah Pibbles have mentally and physically drained me after numerous times being put down, given harsh comments, and overall feelings completely shattered after playing underneath her. <clears throat> I'm here today to bring attention to the problems that have happened over the season. We have had numerous meetings with the coach, assistant coaches, the athletic director, director um, Nikki Norris, the superintendent, Dory Laco, student advisor, Ms. Q, and lastly, Ms. Schwartzbeck. We have, we have asked for Grace Willen and Hannah Pibbles to be removed. We have had countless encounters with bullying and verbal abuse from these two coaches. Not one girl during our large meeting asked for her to stay and remain our coach. To go home just breaking down after practice and games, wondering if I'm in the wrong or wondering what I can do to become a better player to meet her needs. It hurts just to talk about this situation when before it has, been, has brought me to tears, but as a player who doesn't want our future to be held by her, I ask that you completely and strongly consider removing these coaches. No player or student should have to go through what we went through this season and experience the harm caused by Grace Whalen. <clears throat> Thank, you. Thank you for your comments. And next I have Manuel Vasquez. And that is my last form. Hello, good evening. I'm a coach from the varsity softball team and also a parent of uh, Nevea Vasquez. Um, <coughs> just a caveat and playback. Uh, first of all, um, Mr. Petoni, you did a great job with those girls. And I wish we had a, um, a basketball coach that could teach like him. I could see the passion and love that those students poured out, and unfortunately, we didn't have that this year under uh, Coach Whalen. Um, like my daughter said, a lot of mental health issues. Um, I'm also a, uh, a vice president for a local fast pitch uh, softball team, and that's one of our biggest cues, uh, mentally tough girls, boys, everything across the board. Um, that's a huge uh, problem that we have throughout um, athletics and it's not being acknowledged enough. Um, I try to pour that into our girls in the softball program. Um, but really, it was really tough watching my daughter day in and day out come home, cry, stay in her room. She's usually happy, bubbly, come down, talk a lot. She confined herself in her room, uh, didn't want to go places, didn't want to do uh, high school activities, and it was a lot to do with, um, with Coach Whalen and, uh, and the assistant coach coaches. Um, a couple of things, body shaming. Um, Nikki Norris was aware of this throughout the hiring process. A couple of the parents have uh, made these acknowledgments and told them, hey, this is what has happened in previous years. Uh, Nikki bypassed all that and still hired her, knowing that these issues were happening. And they, they continued to happen throughout the year. And I've had two meetings with Coach Whalen and staff, and two meetings with Nikki. I've had a meeting with uh, Ms. Laco, and we're still awaiting the process. Um, <clears throat> and ethnic insens insensitivities, uh, my daughter experienced throughout the years, or throughout this year. Um, I thought that was completely uncalled for. I have never treated anybody with disrespect out of the hundreds of kids that I have coached over the years. I've been coaching for 16 years, and I treat all my kids like they're my own. So when they're with me, 
they know, the parents know, that they are protected and well taken care of. Um, as far as Coach Whalen, she just has a poor lack of knowledge of the game. She's very undercoached. She's, it's, she's new to the game. Uh, this shouldn't be a varsity coach, um, freshman at best. Um, and then also I would like to talk about Miss Norris. With all the parents, I've been to multiple meetings this year and I've heard nothing um, but poor things about Miss Norris, knowing her on a personal level, watching things go over with the, uh, there's just the lack of acknowledging certain issues that we should never have to deal with one being a parent or coaches and these kids, these student athletes. Um, she just, she just didn't care. And she still hired her knowing that these issues and they didn't continued. And then when they were brought up, she continued to not do anything about it. No uh, communication uh, was given to us. So like, hey, this is what's gonna happen. No timeline, it's just in the dark. I know they met last Monday I was unfortunately out of, uh, out of town, so I wasn't able to attend the, uh, the girls' meeting. Um, but I'm still waiting to hear back. It's been a week now, and we're still waiting to hear back from her. Um, like I said before, I've had multiple meetings, and I just feel like we're not heard. The girls are not heard. And so I'm here advocating. I know I have a couple of parents back here um, that didn't wish to speak, but I'm speaking on all behalf. A couple of them couldn't make it because of work or um, the girls couldn't make it because of other sports that have started. But um, I, hopefully I can be their voice and you guys can be, be the action taker. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Vasquez. <laughs> Next I have Jamie King speaking about girls varsity basketball athletic director, followed by um, Brandy Branson, new high school athletic attendance policy. And that is my last form. Good evening. Good evening. Um, earlier today, I sent an email um, that was penned by all of the parents of the girls varsity basketball team, um, and that was submitted to the board. But I did want to highlight just a couple of paragraphs um, that were contained in that letter. Um, this letter was penned December 15th of 2022. And this is my daughter, Kaylee King. She is a um, freshman who was on the varsity basketball team this year. Um, we wanted to first and foremost take the time to thank uh, Athletic Director Norris for speaking with us, taking the time to hear our concerns. However, it seemed like we were kind of doing this over and over and over with her. Um, and so I will just highlight um, a couple of things that were in the letter and then again you do have that at your disposal. Um, first and foremost were the physical health concerns. At one point, the young ladies were going to the weight room during the season and proper technique was not being utilized. And so there were some injuries that could have been avoided had there been proper training and instruction, not only for the coaches, but for the young ladies and proper lifting techniques. Secondarily, mental health concerns. Uh, Mr. Vasquez spoke a little bit about that. Um, but from this letter specifically, we all understand that this is a year of rebuilding for the team. We are rebuilding the program from all aspects, coaches and players. For coaches to foster success, they need to start with a foundation of trust. The communication between the coaches and the players is currently non-conducive to building trust. The players are acutely aware of the negative comments made about and to them during practices and games. They have developed a clear understanding of the good cop, bad cop roles taken on by the coaching staff. Although not explicitly stated, they have realized the impact of Coach Pibbles, who was the assistant, one of the assistant coaches this season, lack of experience and understanding of the game of basketball and player development. And a caveat to that was at our very first parent-student coaches meeting, it was announced that she had no prior basketball experience. And so, but she would be taking stats and she'd be helping in other areas. Well, that lack of knowledge did translate to some poor communication, um, poor skills and translation um, throughout the season. Um, the coach and the assistant coach have not established a foundation of trust and without trust, there is no respect. The continued lack of trust is a barrier to any future success. Academic health concerns. 
Many of our children have extenuating circumstances related to their academic standing. The academic standard imposed by the coaches is not flexible and unreasonable based on the individual situations of our team members. These standards were not well explained, nor were we asked for input when the season started. As parents, we do not support the standard and retract any agreement we were coerced into regarding an academic standard higher than MHSAA standard. So Coach Whalen took it upon herself to enforce a higher academic standard upon the girls um, in terms of their eligibility. And that was not fully disclosed or explained to parents at that first initial meeting or at any other time throughout the season. Um, so that directly affected my daughter as we moved in from a, a different district, first semester freshman, and you know what that entails. So we're talking about a new academic environment, a new set of friends, the social, psychological impacts that that had, especially with it being a female student. We are more nurturing, we are more social. And so that was a big learning curve. And so she was not allowed to play for the first five or six games because she did not meet the additional academic rigorous standards that Coach Whalen had placed. However, she gave each girl an opportunity to determine what team they'd like to try out for and with this stature, she decided to go out for varsity. And it was up to the coach's decision as to what team they placed each young lady on. Well, she placed her on varsity knowing her academic situation and then yet further penalized her. So had a meeting with coach as well as athletic director and we talked about the further disengagement because my daughter was practicing every day and yet still couldn't see any game action. And so she said, well, would you like to put her on JV? And um, at that time, my husband and I did say absolutely not. Her skill set exceeds that level of play. She deserves and earned the right to be on varsity. But what you didn't do is have a conversation with us as the adults in her life. And so that was just one of the many constraints and concerns that we had throughout the season. I think that timer is for me. Um, but outside of that, I thank you for your time. And we do are asking for um, a vacate of those two roles, athletic director and head varsity coach. Thank you. Ms. Thank you. OK. And uh, Ms. Branson, please step to the podium. Good evening. Good evening. I just like coming to talk to you guys. However, um, I am in full support of removal of the athletic director. She does not support our children. She does nothing but mental damage to our children, claiming to care about our children. She does not follow up, follow through. She is not accountable, which seems to be a common thread in East Lansing, high school at least. I'm speaking from the high school perspective. Middle school, I had a great experience. Many of you know, because I've been here several times um, to let you know I've had five kids go through the school. So this high school experience, again, is horrible. And we're coming and we're giving kudos to East Lansing for things that you're approving upon, right? You guys are getting better. However, today, to keep up with the punitive nature of East Lansing High School, we get a lovely new attendance policy which is being implemented today that says beginning this week, March 13th, we would like to support the students with achieving the skills of punctuality, being prompt and timely are skills that, are, um, that will follow our scholars into their post-secondary lives and we can help them be successful by holding them accountable and allowing them to practice this skill now. We will be re, re, sorry, I can't read because I don't have my glasses. Reinitiating the detention support students. As of today, we are going to lighten up on um, fourth and fifth hour attendance. Tighten up, I'm sorry, I need glasses. Students who are tardy or absent for these hours, fourth and fifth, after lunch, more than two times in one week will receive a lunch detention. Furthermore, how will we do this? There will be a weekly report run through power schools with a highlighted students who have at least two or more tardies and or absences. 
in fourth or fifth hours. Students who are identified through this process will be notified the following week and will need to serve detention as a consequence. This is in addition to the already standing policy for less than 20% tardies. So we're teaching them to be on time, but we're going to, we're going to punish you and then punish you again for not being on time, but we're setting the standard and we're teaching them something. I'm not sure what we're teaching them other than we're really good at punishing you guys. That's what we're really good at. Students can receive a detention for both excessive tardies, more than six periods in a week, after lunch specifically, more than two in fourth and fifth hours. So I'm not sure how that's gonna work out. So if you're late to fourth and or fifth hour, you could potentially what? Be suspended. And then they give the open campus expectations. And um, if the student, so they have to go to detention, if they miss, if a student fails to show for a second time, so they, if they miss the first time, they refuse to, they don't show for the second time, the detention will be increased to one day out of school suspension. So again, you guys gave that cute chart, we're gonna start a whole in school suspension program because we really don't want our children to lose their education. But no notice, and you're gonna implement a policy that takes them out of school again. I, I'm not seeing anything positive ever come out of the high school. Never, not never one time. You guys said you were going to help the students. We want them in school. That's what you, you boasted about for, what, the last three board meetings when we talked about the emergency plan? And your high school administration is saying, we're gonna remove students. In addition, we have no appeals process. We're assuming that there's no substitute teacher because I have a son who has been marked tardy or absent and has literally been in class. I have pictures. So what kind of appeals process is there? What kind of true evidence do you have? Because there is no, there is no appeals process. There's no evident, find, no fact finding. This is going to be a problem. And this is a problem that you don't give notice. You're, you're sending this in an email to the parents today, and by the way, we're gonna do it today. We're gonna start this week. That's how we implement policies. I work in a government facility. We give our taxpayers, we give our citizens notice, and our students don't get that same respect. This has gotta stop. Thank you, Ms. Branson. I will close public comments. Um, next on the agenda is board discussion, and we got a little tip off earlier that there's some conversation about board committees. Is that Trustee Edsel? Or? Well, do you want to start? Because you, you were at the meeting last night. Yeah, <clears throat> actually, the parent group had asked last night asked us to define what all of our committees, our subcommittees that we serve on, mean. Um, and you know, in just doing a bit of research, we don't have up-to-date verbiage on the committees that we serve on separately as board members. Um, so Kelly printed out some what we do have, um, but that's we want to work on this verbiage so it's public um, and updated, so we can you know so people know what these all mean. Um, so that's why these were printed out for tonight, um, and we're missing facilities and one other, academic and tech. Um, but these will be updated. Kath has volunteered to do that. So can well, I, I think, or we, yeah. So, so let me just back up to say, yeah. um, board committees uh, are often formed uh, for school boards to do some of the work so that we're not all at this table at, for all of that work. Um, board committees are, we can never have more than a quorum. I mean, can never have a quorum, so it's up to three members in a committee. And the, the current standing committees are um, finance, intergovernmental relations, personnel, policy, facilities, and academic tech are our current standing committees. And so at our organizational meeting in January, um, the once the president is elected, the president is delegated the duty to assign a chair and membership to each committee uh, at that point in time, which there'll be a little shifting around with the, with the change in board membership or addition, I shouldn't say necessarily shifting around. 
Um, in the time that I've served as the longest serving board member here, it's kind of, we've always done things because that's the way you, it was done. You know, the chair of this and you know, so forth. Most of the committees are working with an administrator or a cabinet member whose job it is, like finance, uh, director of finance, um, you know, runs that committee. Curriculum and, and, and um, I shouldn't say runs the committee, but has the information because we're approving budgets and that's the work that, that Mr. Pugh does. Um, uh, and, and so in many of those committees, there's a cabinet member or administrator who is working with the committee, and then we, the committee will bring forward things to the board that they've looked over. But any decision has to be made at the board table. So it's a lot of discussion happens in these committees, but then they're brought forward to the board table uh, to make decisions. But I do think that it's a valued point that we define what those committees are doing. And so, um, we did locate some de some descriptions of the committees, um, but in reading them, to me personally, one, we're missing two committees, and two, um, I don't know that these descriptions, which were written 20 years ago, necessarily do them justice. And so I just wanted to discuss here tonight a process for updating those dis decisions and looking to answers from individuals here on um, uh, you know, should we do this in policy committee? Should one of us, and I'd be glad to do it, um, write up some uh, descriptions um, and bring them to the board table to vote on? Um, should the chairs of each committee write up a description? Uh, those are the options that have come through my head. And the main thing is, I, I feel they should be posted to our website so that if people are looking for what does the finance committee do, that there's a description there that they can understand the work of each of our committees. Okay, let me, let me back up then. So, cause I wasn't at this meeting last night. So. Me either, but I just. Oh yeah, <coughs> you weren't there either. Okay, so at the meeting last night, there was a conversation about what do the board committees do? Mm -hmm. Then, I understand that this is also intersecting with the fact that I'm trying to, <laughs> there's a couple different moving parts here. So when the policy manual was um, updated and revised, because um, I've noticed like these are, like you had Kelly pull this from the old policy manual? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is an old policy, is it? This is current bylaws? Well, the bylaws look like it's from the new Oh. oh, okay, yep, you're right. But not necessarily definition. Yeah. And, and, and the listing of the descriptions, that, but it wasn't in old policy. Yeah. So, yeah, so whether or not we need to address the bylaws, that wasn't necessarily my goal on um, um, how, you know, that the board can establish committees, that's in our bylaws, committee membership, et cetera. Um, the board delegates that authority to the president to determine committee's membership and the chairperson. It's the actual definition of the committee, whether that needs to go into our bylaws or just. Okay, so where did this committee, this one come from? Just the website? She found it in past records. Okay. It wasn't in the Okay, and then so this board advisory committee is this old policy. Okay. And and I think at some point there's I mean we need to we have we have sort of created a difference between a board committee and an advisory committee. Um, I think because sex ed is an advisory committee that is established through specific rules set down by the state. Um, and as an advisory committee, we don't put a board member on it because one, they may influence the decision making and two, the board shouldn't be advising itself. And well, so, that, that's and my so. next question is that this, these, this advisory committee is right. not board committees. Right, so that I don't, 
I think she just printed. Okay. No. Out. Yeah. No. I got you. That's I'm trying to. I'm tracking what. Why everything is in here. Yeah. Okay. And so, and we have two such advisory committees, I believe. Mm -hmm. But we're, there's the work. Were you working on an equity advisory committee? Is that? Uh, Claudia, Miss Burton will be bringing something forward, but just not. It's not ready yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the mental health advisory committee, which we may also have to look at the bylaws for that, because I believe that does include a board member in the bylaws. Um, but that was a little deeper than I was thinking to dig. Yeah, they both do. Sex Ed advisory board and mental health advisory board both have. The sex ed advisory board policy does not include a board member. Um, I, just, I think it I does by default that. because the president is involved in appointing the members to it. But do you go to the meetings? Mm -hmm. As a, uh, you're not, I mean. No, 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 I understand what you're saying. Know. Okay. Okay, anyway, we're getting sidetracked. So, I, I yeah. appreciate your breakdown of it because, yeah, we that needs to be better understood um, for what the committees all mean. But I just think we definitely need updated verbiage for, you know, what yeah. what they all entail. I think that will be helpful for everybody. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I just was confused about what we were trying to do. Okay. Well, and if I may add one thing from. From last night's uh, ELPAT meeting, I think that, that the specific request was just to see a list of committees and what they do. Mm -hmm. so, that's okay, that's, I'm like, what, so that's what, what how, where, how, what do we, do? yeah, okay. And so I do think what was that the request? this is useful for us as board members to consider the responsibilities that we have on these committees, but mm -hmm. it's also useful to, to folks in the community who have questions about, you know, what's happening at these meetings. So um, I'm, I'm all in favor of tightening up these definitions and putting them somewhere in a public, in a public forum. But since we have all of these here, I think we also, I, and we don't need to discuss this today because I think we need to get all of the advisory uh, information, but I think that is something that needs to be looked over as well, especially if we have board members who are supposed to be appointed and that's an advisory role, like Cap said, we shouldn't be advising ourselves. So I think we need to look at that verbiage. Mm -hmm. I'm in agreement with updating the uh, description. I, I am in agreement with updating the descriptions. Intergovernmental has already done so um, since we hadn't met in a while. So ours is good to go and has already been sent to you. You have updated um, descriptions, descriptions for the committees? For intergovernmental, the description and the purpose, since it hadn't oh, met, oh, oh, okay, okay. we just perfect. went ahead and yeah. put it together. Super helpful. So for the other committees, should the chair, like Monica's chair of intergovernmental, should the chair of finance draft that description? Should, you know, I'm chair of facilities, should I take that on? Is that how we should work it? And, and work with, you know, I could work with um, Billy for facilities, or like what's the best way to approach drafting this I feel like that updated. makes sense the person who's closest to it writes the description and then we can all come together and, and, and vote on it yeah yeah I think then it should be an agenda item that's something we could discuss or we could discuss at our board retreat um, I don't know if that's uh, something that we would do there is is to the final tighten it up there that's um, an idea too yeah mm -hmm. and uh, uh, just so we have something Again, so that if somebody mm -hmm. is interested in what our committees do, I mean, this is this came to our attention, and I just wanted to to address it. Mm -hmm. So, and not to add more process to it, but it would seem um, useful if the the whole board is going to vote on it. Perhaps the definition should be voted out of committee as well, so that if the committees meet, they can vote on the verbiage that is drafted by the, the chair in consultation with their liaison to the district so that the board at least has a sense of what the whole committee thought of this description. That um, I just, I don't, I, I'm just trying to think if that's, if our process would be, 
which would be more faithful to the committee structure, to have one person who serves on that committee write a definition sent to the board, or have it be sent out of the committee based upon a vote of the committee. Does that make sense? That yeah. makes sense, yeah. I, I, I would agree with that plan. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these do provide some guidance. Um, you know, the four old ones there for the four committees. Um, the one thing that I've seen in other uh, districts um, a lot of times is to, is a direct tie-in with the administrator or cabinet member or the superintendent who participates in the committee, um, you know, directly providing a lot of the information that it is that we're asked to look at. Well, and then I don't mean to, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Trustee okay, Edsel. Um, would it be useful to spell that out in these definitions that the finance committee is assigned a liaison who is the you know the director of finance for the right. district? Well, yeah, and I think that's in the finance one, right? Yeah. But I know that it's not spelled out in all of these. Yeah, right, right. right. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. If there is one that they should that that should be put into the into the committee description where there is one. Like Mr. Mitchum works with academic tech, so does Mr. Plasky. Um, you know, facilities, uh, the name that she mentioned, uh, policy, uh, finance. We all work with someone in the, uh, you know, in, in the district, and I think that that should be noted or acknowledged in the description. Yeah. No. I, I'm. I'm. Um I guess less concerned about the process and more concerned about it ending up in um, policy so that it is visible to the community. That's, I think, ultimately how we get there is um, less concerning to me. So I'm, I'm happy with any of these options. Cool. Um, are there any thoughts about... Um, I know it seems straightforward, but there are a lot of like intersecting pieces to this. Like we have board committees and advisory committees and where does the information live? So it's a little bit confusing. But are there other thoughts that relate to this topic that people wanna talk about? Otherwise I can open the floor to other discussion items that people may be. I think the main one for me, and we talked about this, of just like, for the specifically for the advisory committees knowing where that information lives and how we get it um like that has been very unclear to me of, of how we actually use that information um so if we just had a much more transparent way that they advise us and we all get the information and what can be shared with the public can also be shared yeah um and i can just say like typically um like the sex ed advisory board and mental health advisory board typically come to give like public presentations um, at appropriate times and that like what appropriate times are dictated by the boards usually, like what does that mean? Um, but I hear like the point is well taken that like, you know, formalizing that, especially when among this group, like that is not known information, um, yeah. In the past, the Sex Ed Advisory Board has chosen to review, I believe, one curriculum every year, at least one curriculum. And so then if they make changes, there has to be a, a public hearing and then a, um, a, the closing of that meeting at the next meeting. Um, and so that's where their annual thing is usually focused on curriculum that they've reviewed and changes that they've made on a yearly basis which comes out of the entire year of reviewing the, the actual committee reviewing that. And then also in the spring is when they usually choose new membership because everybody's on a certain calendar there. I, I would agree that it hasn't been quite as clear to me on the mental health advisory mm -hmm. okay. committee. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Other items um, for board discussion? Um, I didn't I didn't prepare anything, but I, I guess I'd like to open the conversation of um, I'd like to support LPAT's call for an uh, equity audit. I feel like that could be really helpful use for, or useful information for us as we go forward making policy. Um, and I know it would be important to the community. 
Um, I guess I just have questions on how we would get that started. If anyone has any ideas? Well, it's already that. started, so okay, I can great. share some um, background information, and I've talked about this before, but so in the um, uh, policy committee, we've been working on a racial equity policy. Um, part of that, um, there's kind of like two parts to it. Like there's the, um, there is the board directive part of it, which is, you know, our role is a, board to direct the, direct, the, direct the district in terms of like expectations um, of what we want the district to do in terms of, uh, for example, doing an equity audit or whatever that would look like, so a racial equity policy. And then there's a part of it that would be whatever the district is gonna do and that would be, um, I don't wanna speak for um, our equity, um, Director Claudia Burton's work here, but you know, like the work that she has been putting, like enacting whatever that would be. So I'll just speak for our part of things. Um, but one of the, so I'm gonna speak just for myself, not as school board president here, and maybe try not to go, woo, it's dangerous when Tara puts her professor hat on. So I'm gonna try really hard to tamp that down. Okay, so. Here is my cautionary tale about equity audits. I believe in them wholeheartedly. I have put, I've done them, I've worked with districts. Um, I believe in them. So no one's gonna say Tara doesn't believe in equity audits, I do. But we have to be really thoughtful about how we do them. What I don't want to do is just um, do a one-off equity audit where we throw some data together and, um, and that's it. What I want to be thoughtful about is looking at, uh, again, speaking for myself and not having talked about this necessarily outside of um, informal conversations in um, policy. So this is just me speaking. But as a long-term plan, right? Like what are, the, what are the data points that we wanna be collecting, not just at a one point in time, but long-term so that we can track our progress over time, not just one, you know, like our discipline data, for example, at a static point in time, but over time, so we can say, how are we doing on our metric, for example, of um, our suspension data for African American boys, not just in 2023, but 2023, 2024, 2025, and 10 years from now, so we know how that is happening, not just for African American boys, but also for um, girls, not just for girls, but um, girls and um, that we can, you know, look across different demographic categories, not just um, various demographic, you know? Ooh. Those kinds of um, categories are important, the demographic categories, as well as different, um, I, well, no, I just am, like, I'm geeking out a little bit. So the, that is what I'm interested in. What are the categories that we want to track the metrics on, um, and how do we want to be thoughtful about that? How do we want to look at that over time? If we are not thoughtful about those forward-looking projections, and we're just, and we're too fast about it, we won't have the information that we need to be um, as purposeful as we could be to set us up for success. So a little bit of foresight, a little bit of thought now will save us some really, um, will be helpful in the long term. That is what I'm hoping to do. And I shared some preliminary information with the LPAT group um, in that first meeting to say Here's the, here are the metrics that we're kind of looking at these are the, we want to be able, we don't want to leave demographic groups out so that, you know, two years from now we're saying like, oh, well, what about students with disabilities? Oh, shoot, we didn't think about looking at that demographic group, or we didn't think about looking with at, um, you know, we didn't think about looking at what is our representation in um, our advanced placement groups, uh, classes, or we didn't think about, you know, all of these different things. We want to look at a robust set of data points over time so that we can say really interesting and important things about all of our students. Um, and that is my fear about moving too quickly 
with an equity audit now. It's not that it's not important. Um, I feel very deeply and strongly that this information is important. This is where it's tricky about just speaking off the cuff at a school board meeting, and I know I've been talking too long. But that is, anyway, let me stop talking. I want to do an equity audit. I just want to make sure we do it thoroughly and thoughtfully, and it's going to take a team. It can't just be the school board. It can't just be administration. We need the community input. Um, our equity director is super thoughtful about these things, too. But let's just, we don't want to do this fast. We want to do it well. I promise you are thinking about this. It's on our radar. We know it's important. Um, help us do it right. So I'll stop talking. Can, um, can we ask Ms. Burton to speak to a plan to do an equity audit? Yeah, she wasn't able to be here tonight, so I'd certainly want to get her um, input on this. And we've been talking about this for well over a year. And when we considered it, oh gosh, probably last fall, we decided at this point to use the tool provided by the Justice Leaders Collaborative and use the EJAT to guide our work. Um, doesn't mean we can't switch courses, but I know that there are a lot of uh, consideration did go into that, but I'd really want Claudia to be have to have the opportunity to weigh in on this um, process and tool. So you'll check in with her, and maybe she can speak to it. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. you bet. I don't even know where we were. Sorry. Other. D Amanda, do you have anything that you want to say about that? I didn't mean to. No, yeah. you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> um, just as long as there's some forward movement, I'm okay with that for right now. But um, yeah, I'll look forward to listening to Claudia. Um, other items for board discussion? Okay, so we'll move on to action items. We have two. The first is related to an amendment to the Supervisor of Operations and Maintenance contract. I move the Board of Education approves the contract amendment to the Supervisor of Operations and Maintenance as presented. Second. It was moved by Trustee Udsell, seconded by Trustee Lyons. Is there any discussion? Okay, um, all in favor of the motion as presented, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Oh, I also. <laughs> Any opposed? Same sign. Motion carries. Second item relates to safe gun storage. Um, I move that the Board of Education approves the following gun storage resolution. I could probably, you guys should all have a copy, but I think I, I'm, I need to read this. Whereas evidence strongly suggests that secure firearm storage is an essential component to any effective strategy to keep schools and students safe, whereas an estimated 4.6 million American children live in households with at least one loaded, unlocked firearm, whereas every year roughly 350 children under the age of 18 unintentionally shoot themselves or someone else, that's nearly one unintentional shooting per day, and 70% of those incidents take place inside a home. Whereas another 1,200 children and teens die by gun suicide each year, most often using guns belonging to a family member. Whereas in incidents of gun violence on school grounds, 75% of active shooters were current students or recent graduates. Whereas research shows that secure firearm storage practices are associated with up to an 85% reduction in the risk of self-inflicted and unintentional firearm injuries among children and teens. Whereas the U.S. Secret Service National Threat Assessment Center recommends the importance of appropriate storage of weapons because 76% of school shooters used firearms acquired from the homes of parents or close relatives. Whereas across the country, lawmakers, community members, and local leaders are working together to implement public awareness campaigns such as the Be Smart program, which is endorsed by the National PTA and which encourages secure gun storage practices and highlights the public safety risks of unsecured guns. Whereas school districts across the country have begun to proactively send materials home to parents and guardians informing them of applicable firearm storage laws and firearm secure storage best practices. Whereas keeping students, teachers, and staff safe from the threat of gun violence should be the responsibility of all adult stakeholders at each of our school sites. 
Whereas in order to continue with preventative measures to increase student and school safety, we must act now. Now, therefore, it be resolved. The Board of Education directs the superintendent and his staff to update the student handbook to include information about secure storage of firearms. Resolved further that the Board of Education directs the superintendent to create an appropriate letter to be sent to parents at least annually and to be included in annual registration materials at each school site that explains the importance of secured gun storage to protect minors from accessing unsecured guns and be it finally resolved the Board of Education and Superintendent will continue to work with local, enforce, local law enforcement agencies, health agencies and nonprofits to collaborate and increase efforts to inform district parents about secure storage of firearms in their home. Second. <laughs> Moved by Trustee Edsel, seconded by Trustee uh, Lyons. Is there any discussion? Um, this um, was, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say this was um, actually brought to our attention by a community member in, in one of the safe storage gun groups. The state of Michigan does not currently have any safe storage gun laws, though we included that in the re resolution we passed last fall and it may be, um, it may be coming before Congress um, in, in this, during this calendar year. Um, I still felt that it was important uh, for us to to address the issue of, of safe gun storage for our kids and um, and our school members, teachers, staff, students, everyone else. Thanks for taking the initiative to put that together. No problem. And it's I'll just say that it's uh, incredibly informative as well, and I think that um, it would be useful if we reminded the members of our community on a, some, on a regular basis of the importance of safe storage practices. All in favor of the agenda of the motion as presented, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, next we move to committee reports. Um, and we really, um, if your committee has met since our last school board meeting, um, we would receive a report. First up is academic and tech. That's, I believe, Trustee Lyons. Yes. Uh, we have not met since last, uh, I was gonna say last semester, last <laughs> month. Um, we, uh, now that Trustee Martin is um, part of the, the board, we'll, I'll move forward to sending out an email um, assuming that he will take the role um, on academic attack for Debbie. I oh. do not uh, anticipate reassigning board um, committee assignments and I've um, had a preliminary conversation with Trustee Martin and he's fine with just taking on those. Okay, so things. I will send out an email um, here shortly to schedule something for, if not March, April, early April. Uh, facilities, trust, is it Ferris Island? Yeah. Okay. Um, we had a meeting, so I have a few updates. Um, our GMB architect firm is working on a playground package, and ELPS has stressed for this to be completed and installed for the start of next school year. The focus of this package is at Glencairn, Donnelly, and Red Cedar. Wood chips at each playground are reviewed annually, and Billy Hastings, our new supervisor of operations and maintenance, is looking into matting to, putting, to put under all swings. Additionally, more grass will be planted this summer on elementary school grounds where and if needed. Billy's also looking into a door audit, so all handicap accessible doors are working correctly. He will update us at our next facilities meeting on the cost of this. Um, all custodial positions have been filled internally, but one on-call four-hour custodial position. And um, they purchased a mower so the district can handle all necessary mowing instead of working with an outside contractor. And our next facilities meeting is April 11th at 11.15 a.m. Thank you. Finance Committee, Trustee Edsel. Finance has not met. We meet Wednesday at 12.30. Intergovernmental, uh, Trustee Fink. Intergovernmental Committee has a meeting scheduled for March 15th at 11 a.m. in the boardroom. Virtual access is available and can be found on the agenda for anyone wanting to attend. Some updates of note. On Tuesday, February 28th, the House Education Committee approved Senate Bill 12 that would repeal the mandatory retention sections for the third grade reading law. 
It states that if a child is still not reading at grade level as they move into fourth grade, the reading intervention program for that child would continue. Testimony was given as to the harm that retention can cause students and the supports that would follow students who aren't reading at grade level when entering fourth grade. The Michigan Association of School Boards supports the bill, which is now before the full house for its consideration. On Wednesday, March 1st, the Senate passed Senate Bill 4 to expand the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act by a vote of 23 to 15. This bill would include sexual orientation and gender identity and expression as protected categories under the act. Senators spoke to the need to expand these rights to all people in the historic nature of the vote. Others spoke with concerns that it went too far and didn't protect sincerely held religious beliefs. However, rights based upon religion have been long protected under the act. The Michigan Association of School Boards supports this bill, which is now heading to the House for its consideration. This week, both the House and Senate K-12 Appropriations Subcommittees held hearings. In the House, the hearing included an overview of the governor's proposal by the State Budget Office. It also included a presentation by State Superintendent Dr. Michael Rice on the Department of Education's budget and legislative priorities for this session. In the Senate, they heard from Education Trust Midwest and the NAACP Education Committee on Education Funding Models. Kent ISD Superintendent Ron Kohler and Chris Glass from Education Advocates of West Michigan testified on the recommendations of the School Finance Research, Research Collaborative. You can register today to join the spring behind the scenes at the Capitol event on Wednesday, April 19th, 2023 in the Anderson House Office Building from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. This event is a great opportunity to come to Lansing and hear from legis legislators and budget experts who will provide a timely status summary. It also allows for networking between districts to learn from one another. This event is also a chance to speak face-to-face -face with your legislators and their staff about issues affecting your district. For Ingham School Officers Association update, we met March 1st. The ISOA board is reading Schools Cannot Do It Alone, Building Public Support for the America's Public Schools by Jamie Volmer. ISOA is one of the sponsors organizing to have Mr. Volmer host an event to speak to educators, board members, and the community on October 2nd. Uh, at Holt High School Auditorium. More details to come. The Okemos Public School Superintendent gave an update from the February Superintendent's Roundtable meeting, as well as a safety debrief from lessons learned from the recent swatting hoax. Okemos is working with preventative safety, threat assessment, and workplace violence expert, Dr. Margaret Coggins. Following discussion, the ISOA bylaws will be changed to have officers include a president and vice president. The, pres the position of secretary treasurer will be eliminated as the duties are handled by administration at the ISD. Sarah Bellinger, Williamson representative, supported by Dominic Ambrogio, Leslie representative, proposed the slate of Sarah Bellinger for president and Monica Fink for vice president, and the bylaw changed with the motion passing unanimously. The annual Wilson Talent Center Wall of Fame and Scholarship Dinner will take place tomorrow at the Ingham County Fairgrounds from 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. where past graduates will be inducted into the Wall of Fame and current students will receive their scholarships. Next meeting um, for ISOA will be the last meeting of the year and it will be on May 3rd. Okay. Thank you, Trustee Fink. Um, personnel committee uh, has not met. Policy committee, Trustee Edsel. Uh, policy will meet March 23rd at 10 a.m. Okay, are there any announcements this evening? Then we will stand adjourned at 8.44 p.m. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>